Thank you very much for the invitation to the Markus Wallenberg Symposium. So my name is Julia Pongratz and I'm from the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. And it's a great pleasure and really a big honor for me to speak here. But let me still take the time to, to really congratulate Joseph Landsberg, Richard Waring and Nicholas Koops, because what they've done is really groundbreaking work. It's an amazing forest growth model. I think it's serving well beyond science even, and, and this is just amazing. So it's very well chosen laureates and congratulations from my side as well. What I will show from our research is much coarser than the 3PG model. We don't go into species. Uh, we have much less well-constrained mortality assumptions. We are proud if we can distinguish a needle leaf forest from a from a broadleaf one, and if it has coarse carbon pools that accumulate carbon. But still, um, our model, despite its coarseness, has some um, useful functions in that you can couple it to the atmosphere, and by that, apply it to global Earth system studies. And this is what I would like to show here today. So my story, um, in case you don't want to um, stay till the end, is the following. I'd like to show you that um, the humans have changed the extent of forest cover globally immensely. Then speak shortly about our future hopes for forests in that they should serve as big carbon sinks. And um, then show that the carbon aspect isn't really the only thing. There's biogeophysical aspects that are very important to also consider. But there's a big conundrum out there in literature. Even the IPCC special report on land said models are wrong because they disagree from observations. And I think I can show why that is and that both models and observations are correct. And the takeaway message in the end is there's a large mitigation potential possible, though maybe not really plausible, but the adaptation potential may be huge and underestimated. And with all that, please note our perspective from the global earth system modeling. On this map, you see the extent of forest cover worldwide in the absence of human interference. Now let's take out those areas that have been converted to agriculture. You see that about one third of the forest cover is gone. If we overlay now the wild areas, you realize that still the majority of forest is remaining, about 60% of the forest that's still existing today is managed by humans or is degraded by human activity. And so you really see this human dominance on the ecosystem for forest worldwide. And these vast changes in forest area or forest uh, management have severe consequences on climate. Why? Well, you can go basically everywhere because humans have influenced the vegetation cover everywhere. This is just outside um, of, of our um, department in Munich. Originally, this would have all been swamps and forests, but humans came in, cleared the forests, and now we have um, a big, big park, one of the largest inner city parks in the world, the English Garden. And you see that a forest, well, it's a tiny forest here in the middle, but let's take it as a forest. You see that the forest looks very different from the grassland around it. And this is exactly also what climate sees. So what's the difference? Well, first you of course um, realize that the forest um, seems, seems to be much darker. The reflectivity or albedo is lower and therefore it can uh, um, typically absorb more solar light. Also, the forest tends to be rougher and um, also has a higher leaf area. And this combination makes that it usually transpire more, but also because it's rougher, it creates more turbulence. So the um, moisture, but also sensible heat can be transported away more easily into the um, atmosphere. Or conversely, you could also mix down, for example, cooler air masses from above more easily than over the very smooth grassland. So these altered surface energy fluxes or altered hydrology, this is what we typically summarize as biogeophysical effects. And this contrasts to the aspects of carbon cycle. A forest um, takes up a lot of CO2, but then can also store it because of its woody biomass, which flat vegetation cannot do, both in the biomass, but then also um, often in the soil, you have higher carbon contents than, for example, in an agricultural field you often harvest. 
And this together uh, with the nutrient cycles that I can't go into detail here, uh, we call the biogeochemical effects. And these are the sole focus of politics at the moment. And I'll make a point out of that this is not a good thing. One reason for why politics focuses on carbon could also be that the biogeophysical effects are horribly complicated. Just look at this. Um, from this albedo aspect here, you would really expect that the forest is warmer than the grassland because after all, it's absorbing more solar energy. But on the other hand, because it's rougher, transporting more heat away, it's cooler. And so which of these effects dominates depends very much on the season, on the tree species, on the region you are in. So this is, is very hard to get accurately into politics. Here's a proof that these effects matter, that albedo effects matter. This is a scene from the boreal winter and you see the bright snow lying around apart from there where the boreal forest is, it's dark. And for most the boreal forest is masking out the snow that is falling through the dark trees. And we really see these dark patches here. And here's a proof that roughness and the higher leaf area matter. This is the rabbit fence in Australia. And it's not that the rabbits influence cloud cover, but on the agricultural side, you've got flat vegetation that's not transpiring that much compared to the native vegetation on the other side that has a darker color, increased roughness and um, higher convective mixing with cloud cover forming. So this much about the basics of biogeophysical effects. But we said that um, we really hope for the carbon cycle aspects to play out nicely um, in our favor in the future. That's what politically counts, it's the carbon. And this is what the Paris Agreement decided on in 2015, that we want to get um, down below, well below two degrees Celsius over pre-industrial levels, which would require that we um, massively reduce emissions, both from the fossil side and the land use side, but also will require carbon dioxide removal on negative emissions to some extent. Why? Well, first, currently, it doesn't seem like we are meeting the two degree target just with emission reduction, with the current um, policy measures in place, we're aiming still at three degree. And second, um, even if we reach climate neutrality by the middle of the century, as would be required for a 1.5 degree target, afterwards, we may need um, carbon dioxide removal to compensate for too high earlier emissions or we need to compensate for unavoidable emissions. And this all, again, requires negative emission technologies or carbon dioxide removal. The most prominent examples of carbon dioxide removal are natural climate solutions. Here is shown a compilation by Branson Griscom. Natural climate solutions sound better. And in fact, many of them are closer to nature and therefore less risky than many technological options could be that we just haven't investigated very well yet. Also, those natural climate solutions are at hand now different from technological solutions that we first have to scale up in a distant future. So what can these natural climate solutions, these vegetation-based solutions deliver? Look at this compilation. You see the scale for um, the uptake of CO2 per year um, by 2013. And you see some big potentials here, for example, reforestation up to 10 petagrams of CO2 could be taken up here per year. What I would like to point out here is that all those measures that have rather high potentials are based on forests, reforestation, avoided forest conversion, forest management, there's also measures on the peatland side, on the agricultural side, but forests feature very prominently. And you see that there's some pretty high estimates here with 10 petagrams CO2 per year, we're still far below the emissions we're currently emitting with about 40. So there's clearly no way around emission reduction, but it could be part of a portfolio to help us smooth the path to climate neutrality. How do we get to these very high potentials? It's disputed how plausible they are. We ourselves have proposed a study that, that gets numbers like this, but it has strong assumptions. Um, first, 
that the forest responds favorably to CO2 increases while not suffering overly much from extreme events. Looking outside um, the, the window here in Germany, it's not exactly what we see. The forests have suffered from three severe droughts in the last decade. And also what it, these high potentials would require is a high CO2 price to put value on forest and to create money that can go into intensification of agriculture. And only then could we provide the area at large scale for reforestation or all other nature-based solutions like biomass plantations, for example, without interfering with food security. But it is possible, that's just a matter of the CO2 price. But again, carbon is not all that needs to be considered. So this was just a small excursion to the carbon realm. And now let's focus on the biogeophysical effects. We said they've been shown to matter too. Where? Well, first in models a long time ago, already simulations like these came up. So here you see very hypothetical simulations with a global earth system model that assumes that the entire forest cover of the world is cut down. Let's not hope this ever happens, but this is what it would look like in terms of surface temperature. So you see a bit of a warming in the tropical regions, but for most you see cooling effects. And you see them in the um, boreal regions, in the temperate regions. You see a cooling there, you see a tropical warming. So this is what models say about the effects of deforestation. And these um, results have led to warnings already 20 years ago that there may be an offset of the potential carbon sink from boreal forestation by decreases in surface albedo, and that this is something we should not consider as a nature-based solution. But then, here is the observational perspective. In the last few years, there have been several independent data sets coming up based on ground truth measurements, FluxNet data being scaled up, or top-down satellite um, imagery that also is, um, isolates the effect of deforestation on surface temperatures. You see that these four data sets here, they, they differ, but the general picture is the same. And so what observations say is deforestation leads to a tropical warming, but they also lead to a temperate warming, different from the models before, and to a boreal cooling, but really just in some boreal regions. So there's a problem here because the models and the observations don't agree. To reconcile models and observations, we need to take a closer look. And we need to distinguish local and non-local effects. What do I mean by that? Well, consider you're interested in one specific um, patch of forest. The local effects of deforestation would be if you deforest that patch of forest, and check what the climate is altered like in that patch of forest that's no longer a forest. The non-local effects would be if you clear everything else, but not your patch of forest, and then you measure how the climate in this patch of forest is altered, because these are the non-local effects of deforestation elsewhere. And these effects have very different relevances. The local effects, that's what affects local living conditions for humans, for animals, for plants, and therefore is a very strong, um, has a very strong relevance for adaptation. The non-local effects, that's what's relevant for the global mitigation potential. So to come back to our um, earlier depiction of biogeophysical effects, they start out to be local, but because moisture heat just like CO2 are transported off-site, they can affect the entire world and become known local. They may also change atmospheric circulation and therefore have effects really across the globe. How can we assess them? How can we assess local versus non-local effects? Well, you could go out and cut forest. You measure the temperature where you've cut and you measure the temperature in the forest next to it. The non-local effects will be kind of a background noise that cancels. So what you are, will be left with are the local effects. But this cutting down of forest does not work when the person with the chainsaw is an earth system modeler. And when she forgets to take off the protective cover of the chainsaw. So 
we turn back to what we, we're good at, we turn to Earth system modeling. And I don't bore you with the details, but we've developed a, a setup um, that is able to isolate the local from the non-local effects in Earth system models. And I show you results here for deforestation again, but in your head, you can really just swap the sign to speak about the effects of reforestation on temperatures. So here on the global scale, that's the nice thing about models. You can always do it um, globally and hypothetically. This is what happens when you deforest um, the world's forest. In fact, we've deforested just, just three quarters of it. The local effects, um, they show you that there's some boreal cooling, but there's warming in the temperate regions and warming in the tropics. The non-local effects, they're interesting. They are much more widespread cooling. You see, even into the, um, into the subtropics, you find a cooling effect from deforestation. It has many reasons that globally, the albedo indeed has been increased. Less solar light is, is um, overall globally absorbed. Also, there's less, less water vapor in the atmosphere. A, a variety of reasons and play in there. But my point is, this is the answer to the conundrum that models and observations seem to disagree. Here, the observations again, just one data set now for comparison. Look at them and compare them to the local effects and you'll realize that they really look pretty similar. At least in this pattern, you do see the boreal is cooling, but you do see that the temperate regions are warming as are the tropics. And the reason there is that the observations only capture the local effects. It's due to the reason I've explained earlier that when you measure two um, fields next to each other, the non-local effects are the background noise that cancels. So you cannot capture the non-local effects from observations. But the models, they capture everything. Like reality, there would be the local and the non-local effects. Only that in a, in a specific setup, you can really isolate these two effects from each other in the models. And so let, let's go back to again to these very old model simulations I've shown in the, in the beginning. The models capture also the non-local effects. And this is because they create this big, big cooling even in the, in the temperate regions. This is the reason why the models show a much more widespread cooling. So nothing's wrong. It's just a matter of perspective. But the matter of perspective is what is so important. Let's look again here at the maps of the local effects. And let's look at the scale of temperature. We spoke about warming and cooling, but let's look into how much warming and cooling there may be. And you realize the deforestation, and then again, let's, let's swap the sign in our head, afforestation or reforestation can change temperatures by several degrees. And this is why I'm saying that there may be a huge potential to adapt to climate change by reforestation because locally you may compensate for global warming that's out of your realm to, to um, mitigate because you're just a small country in the big world. But to adapt to global warming, you can still make use of land use changes. If you do it in a wise way, you still need to consider wisely um, in which region you are. And of course, what I'm showing here is not going into detail in terms of which tree species you could plant. There's other studies that have been doing that. There's models like this 3PG model that can really give you the results for the carbon cycle um, behind it for how the forest grows over time differently for different species. This is, of course, what needed to be done to really be policy um, relevant. But these are the foundations that show you the perspectives that you need to take to make sure that when we think of forests as a climate um, solution, we're not screwing up things. So. I've shown you our massive impact on the earth system, also in terms of, of forest cover changes or forest management. Our big hopes we place on the forest. And that's, yeah, that could be certainly a big potential to take up CO2 in forests. Even if we don't believe in the very high estimates, the forest will be an important part of a portfolio of CDR options, I'm convinced of that. But the biogeophysical effects are complex and we need to consider them. So the takeaway message, a large potential for mitigation is possible, maybe not very likely, 
but possible, but the adaptation potential by forest cover changes is huge. So I hope there will be opportunity for direct interaction with you in the future. Again, congratulations to the laureates and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here to you. <laughs>